Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. We couldn't be happier to have you here with us today. We've got a great guest, Bonnie Gray. She is an author and an inspirational speaker. She's written a book called Sweet Like Jasmine, Finding Identity in a Culture of Loneliness. That book drops in October. Uh, she was raised in San Francisco's Chinatown and born into a lot of poverty, experienced a lot of trauma at an early age. So we talk about her story and her story of transformation. And um, she comes in identifying as a seven, but early on, Ian and I began to wonder if maybe she wasn't mistyped. And so I'd say maybe halfway through the show or so, uh, it takes a pivot and a really, really interesting turn. Um, a lot of treasure in this one that, uh, that, that gets uncovered. So glad that you're here with us. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. I hope you enjoy the show. And now without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. Bonnie Gray, Enneagram 7, welcome to Typology. Thank you for having me. Great to have virtual coffee with you, Ian. That's right. That's right. Uh, in fact, we, uh, Annie and I, were in San Francisco a few weeks ago, and we had the pleasure of getting together with you for dim sum. Yes, you were such an adventure with me, the seven, the enthusiast. Okay, I'm taking you all on a new experience, and then I found out, Ian, you told me, hey, I've had dim sum before. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, are you picking up some seven energy already? Oh, absolutely, one hundred percent. It's amazing. And I have to say, I was I was jealous that you guys were running around San Francisco in the cool weather when I was sitting here in the humidity of Nashville. So it was lovely. <laughs> but I'd like to have that in dim sum too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, have you had it, Anthony? Have you I had have. dim sum? I oh. have actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, I still got a shot here as an enthusiast for a seven because I told Ian I said we need to get some. Uh, chicken feet, you know, onto that table <laughs> to have you try it. So my, my son is a seven and uh, we were in Washington DC once and we went into this kind of like cool Mexican place, but it wasn't traditional. It was like, you know, experimental hot cuisine, right. uh, Mexican. And the special on the menu was, this is no joke. It was um, grasshopper tacos no way yeah and there were these little teeny grasshoppers about the size of maggots and um he said i've got to have that and he got <laughs> a grasshopper taco and ate it really yeah and the rest of us at the table like it ruined our meals none of we just we're watching him and like all these things are falling out of his taco <laughs> and he's like this is awesome i've never had you know we're like oh dude you are such a seven you guys are like horrified, right? And the son's like, oh my gosh, it's so awesome. Uh, it was a new adventure right there. A gustatory new adventure. Love it. Right? Wonderful. Bonnie, you're the author of the new book, Sweet Like Jasmine, Finding Identity in a Culture of Loneliness. Mm. And you're an interesting seven, and I know this from our conversation, because you have had a journey, an inescapable journey into pain and suffering that has uh, really changed who you are um, and deepened you as a seven. So let's just start with a little bit of, tell us a little bit about the, this. This is a, a memoir uh, and I wanna just hear uh, an overview, a quick overview of this story so we can dive into it through the lens of the Enneagram. Yeah, you know, um, uh, my mother was a mail order bride mm. from Hong Kong. Not only that, she was a teenage mail order bride. Mm from Hong Kong. And then my father was a bus boy in a noodle shop in San Francisco, Chinatown. And so I was born into a story that I did not choose for myself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, oftentimes we talk about story, choose your own path, write your own story. You know, those kind of things, it was like a foreign language to me, Ian. Like I did not exist on the planet of normal people. I, I didn't choose my story. So how does somebody like me, you know, live into my story when it's already chosen for me? Uh, both my parents didn't graduate from high school. They didn't speak English. 
Um, I was born here in San Francisco, Chinatown. And so I ran away from that past. I didn't see any use for it, Ian, because it's a very lonely place to live. When you walk out the door, you go to school and people are living in a different story and you go back home and it's a completely other story you're living in your private life. So in my mind, as an enthusiast, you know, I did not see any need to connect myself with my story of my parents and what was happening at home. I just lived, I tried to just live fully in the story where everybody else lived, which was what I felt was mm. the planet of quote unquote normal people. So the overview for this book and this memoir, actually, interestingly enough, you know, the enthusiast seven loves new adventures, right? Mm -hmm. Curiosity is what is like my carrot. <laughs> You know, it's I'm not the achiever, you, you know, throw money at me. I, I, I worked in Silicon Valley after I grew up and, you know, typical overcomer story. I, I'm here in Silicon Valley. And but you know what? It's not money that motivates me. It's curiosity. And I'm showing this. I know we're on video for the listeners on our podcast, but I'm showing Anthony and Ian this document. It's a certificate of live birth. Mm. It is my birth certificate. And I stumbled on it. Okay, so let me ask Ian and Anthony, do you ever look at your birth certificate? <laughs> Mine's so old. It? <laughs> Mine's so old it disintegrated. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, so I, I never looked at it. I mean, I think I pulled it out once, you know, get the marriage certificate, you know, to get the license, but I never read it, but I just had a baby. Okay, and then I had a three-year-old and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need my three-year-old to go to preschool and make popsicle stick art. Like, you know, I need some sanity. So I went and enroll in preschool and I was going through my files, this old file cabinet and, you know, looking for his birth certificate. And suddenly I found this folded yellow paper. I was like, what is this? And I opened it up and I was like, wait a minute. Why does it say I was born in a Chinese a hospital called Chinese hospital? What in the world? Why is the hospital in America called, named after an ethnicity? And then I looked even closer. It says, my mother lived on the same street as the hospital. And it just hit me. It's just like a ton of bricks. I was like, I've never even seen my childhood home. I never went back. Because Ian, once I got married, I married a Caucasian. He's from Longview, Washington, a mill town. Um, his parents, his family comes from like a heritage of serving in the military. And I, I was born in California. We, we come from opposite cultures. And I was like, you know what? The new kids we have, this new family, I said, I don't want them to feel half normal like I did. I said, I'm just gonna like tell them, you know, stories that are quote unquote normal about my childhood, about I erased everything else. But then once I saw the certificate, I said, wait a minute, one day my boys are gonna grow up and they're gonna ask me, I'm half Chinese American. When did our ancestors come to America? And Ian, my father left when I was seven and I never heard back from him. And I was like, I have no idea. I, what would I tell them? And suddenly there was a bigger problem that meant more to me because it was no longer about myself, but my children. I said, my children need to know their story. I don't want them walking around like with half of themselves in the world, like I did. So suddenly kind of like that, that uh, seven, eight wing came up, you know, that challenger, like for my children, it suddenly rose up that I never had before. And I said, I, am want, I want to go back. I want to find my father for my children. Mm. So this is a really interesting journey for a seven because is, lots yeah. of sevens don't want to go back. Yes. They're so future oriented. Uh, mm -hmm. And part of that is disposition and part of it is the, uh, you know, sort of a strategy of evasion. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes uh, sevens will be they have, they have selective memory. They only want to remember the good parts of the past. They don't want to deal with those sides that are painful mm -hmm. um that were about deprivation and the fear that no one would be there to support them if they were in pain mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so yes. is that kind of tell me i mean what you've spoken a little bit about it but what threw you into the decision to go back you know uh beyond your wanting your children to have a full story was it was it to 
reclaim the fullness of who you are? You know, it's so hard to try. You know, even now in this interview, I'm trying to get away from the pain. <laughs> Ian, you're so wow. like, you know, discerning. Mm. And you're just like, you're pulling me in. You're like, no, Bonnie, I want you to come back. <laughs> Tell me the pain part. And it's so much easier as a writer to write about pain because, you know, and I'm holding up for our podcast listeners. This is the first journal I ever purchased any money I ever had. I bought this in Chinatown. It's a little journal. I still remember it was a dollar. And this was my safe place, Ian. I poured out, you know, all those terrible things that I could not say. I loved in reading your book, you know, The Road Back to You. I loved how you explained that it's about motivation. You know, and so my motivation, like you said, was to avoid the pain. And, um, you know, there was a vow I made to myself because one day I went to try to, my mother dropped me off um, after my father had left this is a few years later but uh we didn't have money to see the doctors because we didn't have health insurance so you know basically you just survived unless you're at the death's door and i was um we need money to have antibiotics so she suddenly i mean apparently my mom knew where he lived i did not know that she just drove me to the back parking lot of tau tau restaurant um and she said go and get your father to give you some money to see the doctor. She's like, because you infected your sister. Look, now she's sick with whatever you have. So you better go fix this. And this is really hard, Ian, because most people don't want to talk about toxic relationships, especially with their mothers. You know what I mean? Fathers, for some reason, I think it's more culturally like acceptable. Mm. That's another place of loneliness. You know, this book, this memoir is kind of like, having to go back to these stories and you know look at those lonely places and i have to tell you it wasn't by choice ian because these flashbacks started sur surfacing mm -hmm. once i saw this birth certificate and like i said i, I love how you you don't let me get away with <laughs> the seven because that's the honest truth once i saw this i started having flashbacks Ian, and they wouldn't stop mm. um and so one of this was what I'm in the middle of telling this story. And, and um, I have to tell you the story, Ian, because it's something that the seven buried her whole life. And suddenly at 42, having a second child, and I got ma married later in life, Ian, I suddenly was overwhelmed with these flashbacks. And it was, was at this moment, I had to step into this restaurant. I had not seen my dad in years. I have no idea what I'm going to say to him. Okay. My mom literally just shoved me out the door, opened the door and pushed me out. And she said, don't come back unless you have some money with you. Mm. So I'm walking there. And by the way, I'm 10 years old. So I went over there. My parents got divorced when I was seven. And then I went over there and I was waiting. You know, when you go to a Chinese restaurant, they, you know, the, the guy tells you to sit there at the chair, you know, where the takeout food is. And my dad comes and he is not happy to see me. Mm. He's like, what, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And I told him, I said, I'm sick. You know, my throat's all sore. I'm sick. Ma I need money to see the doctor. And I was just like at the brink of tears, right? Because I know he does not look happy to see me. He's like, don't come here. I'm working here. He's like, tell your mom, I don't have any money. And he pushes me out the door, literally shoves me out the door, just like my mom shoved me out the car. Mm. And I knew I couldn't go back because I was more afraid of my mother. You hear? Mm. So I said, I turned around with just tears just coming out of my eyes. And I said, I, I, mom says, I can't come back with you. Don't give me money. I can't go back. And then to my terror and horror, okay, for me, my father takes out a wad of cash. And he just said, told me, it's like he ignored that I was sick. And he shoved me out the door, but yet he had money. And he put these like, dollar bills these five dollar bills from his kits that he gets as a bus boy and he just like you know shoves it into my hand and says go don't come back and i made a vow at that 10 year old as i was walking through the parking lot ian i said to myself i will never ever ask anyone for anything ever again mm -hmm. i swear to myself I will never, ever ask for any, even if I am poor and I am, I end up dying on the streets, I'm never going to ask anybody for anything. And that vow 
apparently stuck in me. And it's covered up by the seven. That's the enthusiast. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I took that strength and energy as a seven, you know, and I just took it to cover up that vow to get as far as way ever from that fear of ever being in that place again. And so, but you know what, Ian, when I looked at this birth certificate, it wasn't by choice. And I don't know if we want to talk about it, but it's like PTSD. Okay. It, I didn't know about PTSD by the way, but it started surfacing. I started having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't by choice. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't think we we're going to talk about it, but here we are. Ian, that's all right. This is, that's all good. We, we love that. And I, and I, we, I appreciate your vulnerability. And I think, again, it's a very seven story. The, the feeling that you're on your own, that no one else is going to be there for you. There is a hole in your soul um, and you that you are gluttonously trying to fill uh, yes. and to avoid feelings of deprivation, right? Yes. And, and so describe the hole in your soul, that feeling of emptiness at the core of your person. I think, I think I'll talk about how that felt at the beginning of the story in Sweet Like Jasmine, because there's a resolution at the end and I don't want to give it away, right? I, <laughs> but, um, and I didn't know it was loneliness, Ian. Mm. I thought that was just normal to feel like I didn't belong anywhere, mm -hmm. that I didn't fit anywhere, that I never really knew who I was because I was so busy morphing myself into whatever it took to belong. You know, so at school, I was like this, like, you know, um, you know, uh, ideal teacher's pet. You know, I really love Bonnie. You know, I'm always raising my hand. Okay. When I worked in Silicon Valley, like I was like morphing. I was like wearing the Banana Republic outfit, you know, like the whole outfit. And then I was like, ha, 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 you know, talking about the weekend and the games that were on TV. You know, it's like, this is just my modus operandi. So I never really understood it was loneliness, but I saw it more as not belonging. Mm -hmm. So that, that hole was a feeling like I don't belong anywhere. And I always felt like I was just this weird person. I, I, I just felt ill fitting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just feel uncomfortable. Um, uncomfortable with myself and and i said well maybe that's just because my mother's a mail order bride and she was a teenage mom my, my, my past is broken i guess i just have to live like i'm a broken person but i i just accepted it as reality i think that's the rationalization of the seven you know one time i my mother told my told me and i, I think i took this on i was uh, she was cutting up pictures when my father left the day my father left he was having his suitcase and I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Why, why are you leaving? And of course my parents are arguing, right? And, and then suddenly he leaves, slams the door, the car just, the Nova, you know, he has like that Nova from the seventies with the olive green Nova with the peeling rooftop, right? He just, you know, screeches out the driveway. And my mother, I said, what's going on? Where's dad going? What? It's actually Baba in Chinese, it's Baba. Where's Baba going? And then, my mother says, pull out those album. You know, she starts ripping out the photos and she starts cutting them up. I said, oh my gosh, she's going to rip up all his pictures. And I, I was thinking about hiding Ian, one of the photos, you know, kind of behind me. Because she's so like furious. She's raging, right? She's just shredding everything. I'm like, okay, I got to save one. I was trying to like be sneaky, you know? And she's like, what are you doing? She's like, why? Why do you want to keep a picture of him? You want to go live with him? She starts dragging me across the living room. She's like, okay, I'm going to call him. He's going to come back for you. Go pack your bags. And I'm like crying. She's like, you better not ask me anything about your father. She's like, you know, those kids and, you know, I'm from the seventies, right? Ian. So there's like the Jerry Lewis telethon that happens. And she's like, look, these kids, they don't even have any limbs and they're just fine. So she's like, you have two, two arms and two legs. You're fine. So she's like, not everybody has a dad. Some dads die. They die in war. They die in accident. They get hit in a car. And she's like, you can't use that as an excuse. So she's like, you'll be fine. And suddenly I stopped crying, Ian. I was like, that's right. 
I do have two hands and two feet. I'm going to be fine. That's kind of like I took that on. So it served me well. Ian, sure. It served me well. It got me in a lot of good places, but I was lonely inside. I was very, very lonely. I was, I just felt so in my darkest hour. I just cried mm. sometimes, you know, and also not being able to find somebody, you know, dating wise. I was like, maybe I'm just destined to be alone. So I, I want to. I'm going to throw something out at you. And this happens every so often on the show. And it's always fun when it does. Um, your, the, your experience and the way you describe your inner terrain makes me wonder if there's another type that, might, that you might entertain or, or look at for pup. Because in the, you know, Again, I never tell people their type, but there is another. You sound like another type on the Enneagram in addition to seven. Tell me. Well, so, you know, there are three kinds of fours, right? And um, one is, is, is the counter type. I won't go into all of this with you, but it's called the sunny four. And the sunny four Ooh. Uh, often if they'll test or mistype themselves as a one, a three, or a seven and wow uh, i know i know i happen to be a self pres four so let me just unpack it a little bit for you and because there's a lot of energy here that feels self pres four versus seven and it's a very common mistype because the self pres four has a funny energetic uh, optimistic uh exterior but it it um, it the experience and the reason for it is completely different than it is for a seven, okay? Wow! All right, so let's let's unpack it just a little bit. It would be a gift, Ian. Well, let's see if it's true. I don't know if it's true, but Anthony and I just texted each other <laughs> and went, "Is she a self press four? So <laughs> let's just see, okay? Thank Let me. You so much. Okay, I'm all ears. All right, let's just uh, unpack self press fours for a second. So. Um, all fours typically have a little bit of an addiction to suffering and uh, to their own suffering and they deal mm. with it differently. Um, the self press for is long suffering. They suffer inside, but they don't show it. Ooh. Okay. And um, long suffering, meaning that uh, they endure pain quietly, silently, for a long time. They have issues around abandonment. All fours do, right? This feeling that there is some unnameable brokenness in them, some fundamental flaw, some Achilles heel that they have that no one else seems to have, right? Ooh. And they spend a lot of their lives on a quest. They struggle with self-esteem issues. They uh, are always comparing themselves to other people and coming out feeling inferior. And um, they, the, the self-pressed for suffers quietly. And it often can be masked by this optimism and this cheeriness and this uh, ambition. You know, they can be very ambitious. And they also have a strong inner critic, right? Because they, they're they, it's just a part of their, their makeup. I, I've told Anthony and others before, I think fours have this next to ones have the, the loudest inner critic. Okay. And uh, they, um, the social four radiates suffering. Like you can feel it coming off them on the outside, right? Mm -hmm. An unhealthy one to one four makes other people suffer. They project their broken piece onto another person and the, the danger for them, if they're not very self-aware is then they, they, they beat up the person onto whom they project their own brokenness. Mm. Okay. But that self-preservation for also, you don't see envy in them as much as the other two fours. Okay. Um, yeah. But it's there. But the way they cope with envy is by working really, really, really hard. Right. To get what they perceive others have that they don't. That's why they can look like the three. Yes. Because they're, they aren't, uh, really handicapped like the other fours are, right? No, and, and they, you know, it's a compensatory kind of a thing. 
right? It's like, mm. I'm compensating for this missing piece, this broken mm. part of me. And you've been using this language throughout the whole conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the energy, the other thing I'd say is, and I'm just going to be completely frank, your, your speech is energetic and I can feel that it's slightly pressured. And what that tells me is there's like this desperate longing to be understood. Like you're really, I can see it in you. Like, I want to be understood. Do you understand me yet? Do you understand my complexity and the complexity of my situation? <laughs> and do you see the uniqueness of my situation? That's now, right. granted, right. your situation is unique. All of our mm -hmm. patterns and our histories have their own kind of uniqueness. But fours are always, always highlighting it. You know what I mean? And we're all fours here, so we... Yeah, you're all... You're easy. safe. You're so safe, it's ridiculous. You're safe, and it's why we can see it. So. so, like, I would encourage you, and the place I would go is to Beatrice Chestnut's book, The Complete Enneagram, and read up on self-preservation fours. Because I'm, I'm, I am hearing a lot of that language in you, and I can see why you would... Like, let me just tell you this. For a long time, when I would take Enneagram assessments, and some pretty good ones... I always came out of seven. Wow. Yeah, because I did an assessment and I came out of seven. Did you, yeah. And did you ever come out of three? Yeah. No. Okay. No, no. Three is actually the lowest. I did the SETI test and um, it tells you like numbers mm -hmm. for, um, you know, how high, how many numbers that you would rate for each um, Enneagram number. And actually three was the lowest. Okay. So. I have zero. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just saying there, there might be some. Uh, value in looking at the self press for. I actually wanted to talk to you about this, Ian. So I kind of had like a hidden uh, motivation. <laughs> I was like, oh, good. I'm coming on air with Ian because, um, you know, when I read seven, you know, one thing that I did in my career in as in my 20s when I, I studied engineering and I worked in Silicon Valley in high tech and I was in, um, in, in involved in supporting the executive management releasing products and I specialized in saving doomed products. That was kind of the reputation I had. And I feel like as a seven, that's why I felt like I'm really a seven because I love being able to come in short-term projects, saving projects. And um, I'm really good about, you know, looking at all the positives. So it feels like I'm the survivor seven, like the seven that had to survive, but I felt like mm. since this happened and what this book is about and why you're hearing the same um, words, it's very vulnerable for me, Ian, because when I write, I'm that four you're describing about you know my need and my desires. But if I were to meet with you in person or when I'm kind of walking around, I, I don't operate as a four. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. But the, so but the, that's why I'm like, am I a seven or am I a four? But as a writer, in my story, in mm -hmm. my journals, I'm a four. Yeah, but here's the thing. Mm -hmm. The, the self-preservation four is the counter type. It doesn't look like a four. Oh. It's upside down, mm. right? And your relationship to envy is very different yeah. than the other two fours. Yeah, right? Claire. Yeah, because I don't get envious. I'm like, I love it when my friends do great and I'm like their cheerleader mm -hmm. and I mean I help people even when they don't help me mm -hmm. I mean I love it I just love like it I feel that's why I'm the enthusiast because I see other people happy yeah. like I feel filled up mm -hmm. well me too yeah one of the things one of the things I want to say to that uh because just Please to clarify what I said earlier like the other fours get stuck in their envy but um the self-pres four um uses that envy may not even be aware of it to go get what they think they're missing right mm -hmm. so so whereas the other two would get stuck in their envy and kind of cycle through it and loop and and probably you know lose their motivation uh the self pres for will just grind it out right oh yeah and they're there's they're slightly masochistic they'll drive themselves and and the masochism can show up in how long they'll endure suffering silently. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, wow. there, there is a part of the self press for unconsciously that feels like people will see them and love them for their silent suffering. Mm -hmm. Like they value mm -hmm. their, their endurance. Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah. Their ability to wow. endure suffering. And that becomes a way for them to win belonging and a sense of wholeness and, you know, the love of others, you know, and uh, so again, this is when you start to get down into the Enneagram and you start to see very nuanced material.
right? And again, you may be a seven, right? You could come back to me in a month and go, yeah, I really checked out self presence fours and I really identify with seven. But it's really helpful when, when you see these lookalike patterns to go, to open up, to be curious, uh, like, which is your gift, and to kind of go, hmm, I wonder, I wonder. I, you know, my son is a seven and only recently has really maybe come to understand without any prompting from me that he's a self pres for. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so what had, what led him to that aha? Well, um, I think, uh, and interestingly, and I don't think he'd mind me saying this, he's a self pres for with ADHD. And that okay. made it even more complicated. Mm -hmm. It made him think even more that. that he was a seven. Yeah. Right. And no, I think uh, it's his relationship to suffering um, that sometimes he gets uh, when emotion, strong emotions come up and he has strong emotions. Right. Um, what begins to happen for him is he can't really move on to a lot of other stuff until he resolves the suffering, the mm. feelings. It's like, you know, he can't put his feelings like deal with these feelings on a to do list while he does other stuff. It's like when feelings come up, they take center stage mm -hmm. for him. Okay, I wanna ask you a question, Ian. So how would the seven deal with that? I, uh, compared to what you just described about, you know, how the four self pres would, you know, can't move on, well, you know, like until that they can. So how would the seven handle well, that? Well, they can better than the social four. Okay. Okay, uh, because they are, ambitious and they want to get stuff done like like let me give you another example of of like a difference between a self press for a self press you know sometimes a social four can be a little eccentric and they they sort of have this kind of interest in the avant-garde and you know things like that and um they uh and because of that they they sort of stand out in the crowd. You know what I mean? Like, like it could be their clothing, yeah. the way they express themselves, yeah. the way they're withdrawn sometimes in a group. A mm -hmm. self press four doesn't do that. A self press four actually would do a little bit of what you described at work, where you're able to like put on the Banana Republic thing and do this thing and the next thing, because they don't want to stand out too much because that would stand in the way of their, uh, um, succeeding in the world which would might lead to their being belonging and acceptance and, and make the envy go away right the comparing themselves to other i mean do you ever compare yourselves to others and come out of the low end of the stick i mean to be honest with you i don't that's why i feel like i'm i, I lean towards a seven because i'm more focused on whatever it is we're trying to get done and so i don't really think about myself but but see, here's the but and why this sweet like Jasmine, the, you know, finding my identity. It's like the inner, my inner world, what you call the inner terrain, that landscape, though, in terms of my feelings, I do, because I'm very aware of my awkwardness. OK, I'm standing there at the board meeting and I'm, I'm doing my job and I'm able to, you know, I love working with people and people love working with me. But inside, as I'm standing there, Ian, I'm like my emotions, like what you're describing, yes. like, wait, um, am I okay? Right. You know, like, um, are people like, you know, able to get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's why, like what you're saying is very compelling to me, you know, um, because I feel like so much of it is true. And like, you know, you're saying you're hearing these patterns, these words. Well, so, you know, identity, um, the, the issue of identity is yeah. central to twos, threes, and fours. They have a sort of an, uh, until they do their work, they have kind of an unstable sense of identity. And so that's another oh. piece, you know, and I, when I had lunch with you that day, it was fascinating how yeah. much time you spent talking about the meaning of dim sum, what it symbolized, why it was yeah. important to our time together, right? And why you wanted to have dim sum in particular with me because of, it's meaning. What was it again? What does dim sum mean? It was touch of the heart. touch of the heart. And that was such a big theme for you. And I remember sitting there going, hmm, hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's it, that, like being swept up in metaphors and symbolism and 
Uh, these kinds of things are intoxicating to force. Yeah, we love it. Like, yeah, man, we just wow. can't get I wish enough I of that been stuff. There. <laughs> oh yeah, like you know, it's fantastic. Right. You know? And so again, I'm not saying you're not a seven, and I'm not saying you're a self-pressed four. What I'm saying is, lots of times, self-pressed fours get confused with ones, threes, and sevens. And no, I really love this, Ian, because you know, I, you know, through this journey, that's I feel like that's what's surfacing like i always thought i was seven and then this 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 birth certificate unraveled this whole story and as i tried to find my father and uncover all these family secrets that i've avoided my whole life like you said all these words started popping up like belonging mm. loneliness mm -hmm. pain you know and i'm like oh my gosh this, is this like a four so i love being here and i love that you said it and i'd even tell you about it and you kind of just let your challenging me you're like bonnie you need to be curious look at this so i'm like okay i'm like totally like i'm just so amazed right now and i i mean i love it mm. i love it so when i get off this uh this zoom call with you i'm actually going to go and grab my book because it's only two pages long on self press force and i'm going to take a picture of it okay and i want you to read it and um uh, and then text me and let me know what you think. Uh, because, and then think about it. It, it requires mm -hmm. pondering and self-reflection and discernment, right? And then you go back and you think about seven and you think, gosh, which, which of these two sounds more like me? You know, like which one, which one when I read it kind of might bring, um, might bring up emotion for me that's like, oh... You, you know, and I'd like to say something about envy because um, our relationship to envy is so unique and I think it can be hidden. So for me, uh, as a musician and an artist, I, I remember I used to see someone doing what I was, you know, doing or, or, or wanted to do somebody that I admired. And like slowly as I'm admiring them, I would begin to imagine myself doing that and myself being in their position and myself being in their shoes, which is how that, it, and I just thought I was motivated. I just thought I, that's, I want to do that. And then it would like, you know, it would inspire me, but it really was like, why couldn't I just be me in that situation? You know, why mm -hmm. did I have to become mm -hmm. them in my imagination in that point? It was, mm -hmm. it was really subtle, but mm -hmm. it's, I think it's just interesting how, how we can express our envy yeah, and, and also, here's the other thing about passions. It's, you know, it's the old fish water trope, right? It's, it's the, you know, oh, I've been swimming in it so long, I don't even know it's there, right? And I remember with envy, when, when I was described as that was my deadly sin, I remember thinking to myself, no, I don't have a problem with envy. And within two weeks, <laughs> I saw it everywhere. Right. You know, I was like, so, you know, your initial resistance to it is normal. But, but you may discover as you go along that you, uh, and again, you don't want to use confirmation bias. You have to be careful of that. But you, you do, you know, it's like just being curious and open, you know. Um, I have to imagine, you know, because you did grow up in an environment, you, you, you know, where you have, you know, your high school friends over here and they have this life, but you have this other life, you know. I mean, that is my story. You know, that is my story. And there was a piece of me that really envied their story. Mm. Wow. I wanted, I wanted their story. I wanted to fit wow. in and belong in their world. But I had this other story that was so broken, uh, you know, in my life that I was like, and by the way, I became really good with those other kids, right? Growing up at looking like I was in their story. Mm. Wow. Adjusting myself and accommodating it, right? Wow. And so that's wow. where you might think that's a three-ish quality, but it's not because the motivation for doing it is so different. Now, why are you wowing right now? Okay. You just hit it. And you just, you, you'd like, it's like, you know, finding treasure among the soil of our conversation because that is actually the whole you know how i get there is obviously i don't want to give it away it's the cliffhanger it's a resolution i realize that 
it's I didn't know until this conversation connecting to the Enneagram that I envied other people's stories. Mm. You know, when we first brought up envy, I would think of things like, oh, things people have or fame or riches or, you know, like uh, uh, applause. I, I don't envy any of that. But what you just said, Ian, and I loved your book. Your Yours is one of the books that I said, I I want to write my story. Once I read yours and also Donald Miller, Million Miles, and I read yours, Ian, you know, Jesus is my father, the CIA, you know, I was like, I related to the climax in that book where you had that altercation with your dad. I said, I, that I get, I feel the same way. And I said, this was 10 years ago. This book has been a 10 year journey, Ian, to write this book. And um, I realized right now in this moment, that is exactly how I felt. And the, the resolution of the journey, what happened when I went back to uncover these secrets, it's about embracing my story. Mm -hmm. How did I find true belonging? Mm -hmm. It's embracing my story. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we don't realize the belonging we, lo we, we look for and desire. It's actually when we accept that brokenness is beautiful. Ah. And wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, finding brokenness is beautiful, uh, belonging, um, and finding your place in the world. These are the large existential questions that really get under the skin of a four, right? See, so now maybe you're leaning me now towards maybe looking into this because you just said envying you in, through your story, which I relate to and connect with. Mm -hmm. Like because I was like, no, no, no. In my head, you know, the inner dialogue as we're talking about India, I'm like, no, no, I'm checking off things. No, no. But when you just said that, I was like, whoa, mind blown. You know, the emoji where like, yes, you know, right. The head's blowing up on top. Mind's being blown. Yeah. yeah. That's but you see, right now. You, you see, envy is different than jealousy. So don't, conf don't confuse the two of them. You might be thinking of jealousy, which is different. Um, envy is like looking at the characteristics of another person and longing for them. Right. Like, like, oh, I wish I had that, you know, jealousy has to do with something you already have and the threat that someone else might take it like you're, you know, like you're jealous of your spouse um, because maybe someone else has interest in them and it arouses like a certain sense of possessiveness. Right. Uh, but but envy is more about longing for the characteristics of it's not about things as much as it is about the character, the inner characteristics of another person. Well, I think the story part, that's what mm -hmm. really spoke deeply yeah. to me. Well, that's an inner terrain issue. And so, again, I'm not saying you are a self pressed for all I'm saying is that mm, maybe you maybe it would be worthwhile investigating. Right. Well, um, Bonnie Gray, author of the new book, Sweet Like Jasmine, Finding Identity in a Culture of Loneliness. This is an amazing, amazing story. It is, uh, dr you know, dropping October 5th. Right. Yes. Uh, and uh, into the world. And uh, you can check out Bonnie, uh, her, you know, her, all of her socials are at, at the Bonnie Gray. It's B-O-N-N-I-E-G-R-A-Y. And her website is www.thebonniegray.com. Bonnie, thanks for, for coming on. And will you text me after you read this material and let me know if, yes. if you're like, ah, oh, maybe let me do more investigating. Of course. And I just want to invite listeners to go to Sweet Like Jasmine dot com okay that's where listeners can you know learn more about this journey of finding belonging and also how beauty is made out of brokenness mm. and mm. there's a free sample of the uh, initial chapters as well as a free audio book Ooh, love uh, it yeah then i i narrated i go into you know what I thought was the seven, but maybe now it's that self press for of dramatic telling. So I, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to be here with you and to share about this journey that's taken me 10 years to arrive at. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful to have your, um, your thoughts yeah. about the whole issue of identity and finding identity. Wonderful. So thank you for 
your words. All right, everybody. So Sweet Like Jasmine, Finding Identity in a Culture of Loneliness by Bonnie Gray. Bonnie, can't wait to hear back from you. I will. Thank <laughs> you. And you, uh, you wonderful typology listeners, remember these words. May you have love. May you have joy. May you have peace. May you have healing. And may you have rest. Until next time. <laughs>